So your vision really should be something that either pulls people in or also helps you not make the mistake of hiring someone that actually is not going to pull energy in for that vision. Hello, and welcome to Build Your Remarkable Practice podcast. This podcast is dedicated to chiropractors who are in the seasons of launching and building their practice. Join myself, Dr. Lona, and my co-host, Dr. Bobby, as we have conversations each week as it relates to building the practice of your dreams. And remember, you can have a remarkable practice as part of a remarkable life, not instead of one. We are here to lead you on the way. Welcome back, team, to the Build Your Remarkable Practice podcast with the amazing Dr. Lona Cook. Dr. Lona, what's going on? Hey, I just got off a coach's meeting. Just saw you on there. Yeah, we were meeting and we were training, guys. We do the same thing. We train and we meet every single week. And, of course, myself, Dr. Bobby Lajasovic, where we bring to you every single week what are the systems, processes, and procedures to, first of all, launch and build your remarkable practice, but then really where all the fun sits is then how do we take it and how do we scale it, right? Where the scale means let's start adding multiple team members, let's start adding multiple locations. And so on that, I'm really excited for today's conversation because like, Lona, when you and I were sitting here discussing, okay, it's time for us now to start unpacking what we call the fourth pillar of practice building. And it's very interesting because my experience with this pillar is in the early days, all my interest was around attraction, marketing. So how do I like get new patients into the door? In fact, even when I graduated and I was uh, looking at associateships, I worked as an associate when I first started one, I think for like seven months um, before I was like, all right, find my own practice and I'm, I'm jumping into that. But I remember in the beginning, I was always like attraction. How do I get new is in? Then I quickly started to recognize and realize, all right, I actually don't have to learn how to convert people. What, what, what's a proper conversion system that leads to retention? Then on the back of that, I was like, well, hang on, we need education processes, we need systems to retain people because quite frankly, what I realized is the more that we see somebody and the deeper that someone engages in care, the healthier they get. But then really it was this fourth pillar that when I learned this fourth pillar and when I then set on a mission to create a master around this fourth pillar, this is where everything changed. And the fourth pillar that we want to talk about today, building your micro practice, is the pillar of team building. So it's the pillar of putting together an awesome team, or if you're an associate, or if you're someone that's just launching, going into an amazing team. Because, well, I know you and I were talking about this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts um, and your, feed, your feed, feedback on this as we go deeper with it. We were talking about this just earlier. And one of the things that I was saying to you is, I would say now in my over decade in chiropractic and having worked with, at this stage, hundreds, probably close to a thousand offices, one of the things that I see is, I would say a constraint on individual chiropractors. And one of the things that really holds us to a lower level than really where we need to be and where we should be is this idea of isolation. And that there's so many chiropractors just living and practicing in these silos of isolation, whether that means, oh, I'm an associate or practice by myself, I'm on the only one on a shift. Maybe I have a CA with me, right? Or maybe you're a doc who's launched and it's like, oh, it's just me. Maybe I've got one or two team members, my CA, but it's primarily me. But we have these silos of isolation. And quite frankly, as humans, I know that we're not designed to live like that. Mm. So when you hear team building, I know at the moment now, obviously, you've got multiple locations, you've got a huge team. But I'd love to hear, when you hear team building, what was your experience with this? It talked to us a little bit about, okay, when you first launched your office, or some big learnings and big realizations like that that you had about team that really started in that journey around finding an awesome team, and then training an awesome team, developing and scaling an awesome team. I'd love to hear your journey and your insights in this. Yeah, I had a very interesting introduction into having a team. So this is a true story, but a very weird story. So um, when I found myself, um, because I actually did not think I was going to launch a practice right out the gates from school. And I, I ended up doing that, but it was because a lot of doors shut, kind of forcing me to look at a different avenue, which was entrepreneurial, like, let's get the doors open. I'm going to build it myself. And what happened was um, I went back to my hometown, which was the last place that I thought I was going to actually end up. And as I was getting a lay of the land, doing my business plan and starting to figure out, okay, am I going to open here? And, and what square footage am I going to open in? And all of those conversations, a phone call was left on my parents' answering machine. This was, you know, 14 years ago. And 
it was someone who didn't even know me and barely knew my parents, but someone had told them that I was going to open a practice. And this woman said, I don't have a lot of um, knowledge of chiropractic, but I've got time on my hands. And if she needed someone to <laughs> come and answer her phones, I'd be willing to do that for free. And I remember thinking, what the heck? Like, this is crazy. And so I had coffee with her and she um, was like the mom that didn't vaccinate her kids. She was like, like a chiropractic person, but didn't even know what chiropractic was. And so she was my first CA for the first three years of practice. And of course, eventually I got to pay her and, and she massively grew my practice with me. But I, I accidentally stepped into having a great team. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand culture. I just had a passion for chiropractic. And I started taking her to seminars with me and we grew together. Um, and I say that I didn't know what I was doing because I remember thinking she's teaching me more than what I'm actually offering her because she was almost twice my age. She had been in other positions. She, I remember calling an accountant one time um, because I was trying to understand something. And after the call, she was the one that like explained it to me because I was so new and green in understanding what I was doing. I was isolated. I didn't know how to do business and I didn't know how to do chiropractic business. And so she helped me. She really baptized me into like having a team as well as, um, recognizing that I wasn't going to do it alone. I was going to need to build people around me. And I, I'm so grateful that somehow I got lucky enough to have that as my first experience, which I know is not realistic for most people. Um, but it's a true story. Um, and so when you were talking, Bobby, I also kind of thought about, you know, all of us have gone through the wacky world that we've experienced the last four or five years here and how critical it's been to have like-minded individuals around us and chiros you can lean on and culture that you know we talk differently than a lot of the average people outside our four walls about health and well-being and what's happening in the world and so if more than anywhere i think it's been important for us to have our people that we do life with we do business with and we can lean on yeah yep 100 percent you know, I remember when I graduated, even like six months later, when I started talking to a lot of my classmates, what I recognize is that so many people that were struggling in associateships and even the ones that had launched but were on their own, what they were, the ones that were struggling with really had in common is the environment and the team that they were plugged into. So for example, if you had associates that had struggled in their first few months and that, you know, when I was meeting up with them later, right, which is now when we're out in the real world, adjusting spines and saving lives, the people that you know, weren't having a good experience, the overwhelming commonality that I would see is like, yeah, my principal isn't, you know, supporting me. I'm not getting the training that I need or I don't have the support that I need or I don't have a team around me or he expects me or she expects me to go out and just start generating all my new ease and go meet people and go do screenings in your own and go do talks in your own and go and meet personal trainers and talk to people, right? Like, but what I started to recognize is the pattern over and over and over and over again was that they just weren't plugged into the right team, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I know the team is something that we can go into detail and we are going to do multiple episodes on team building, guys, okay, in growth now and in the future. But I like to look at it and separate it again into different seasons because it helps create context for me. So I know one of, one of the things that we spoke about is let's look at team as, okay, Start the start of our journey. So you could say start of the journey is graduation. When you finish chiropractic school and you're ready to be a chiropractor. In fact, you could even say start of the journey is prior to that as a student. I look at like the first two to three years that you're out in the real world. And what does team mean for you then, right? Now, there's two kinds of people. You either need to get plugged into an awesome team. So if you're an associate that's looking for associateships, you're listening to this, or you just maybe graduated or you just started an associateship, the primary thing that I always say to people to look for is not necessarily the contract, is not necessarily the pay, is not necessarily well, this job is offering me X percent, this one's offering me 5% more percent, right? It doesn't even matter. Sure, those things are important. But the number one thing in those first two to three years to look for is the team that you're getting plugged into. Because at the same time that I was talking to those people that were like, oh, I'm not liking my first six months, he expects me to screen, he expects me to talk, right? I was doing all those things. I was screening, I was talking, I was going out to gyms, I was networking and I was loving it. But here's what I recognized. I wasn't doing it alone. So I was doing it with like always one, two, three, four other people. I'd be at a screening and be three of us and we'd have like a screening competition. It's like, well, I've got 
five sign ups and you'd be like, damn, I'm on three. And then you'd be like, oh, I just signed up three people, a family, I'm on six. I'm like, damn, sign up a couple, I'm on seven, right? And the third person would be like, well, I'm on eight, right? It's like, oh, all right, line up, let's talk to more people, let's screen more people. What I recognize is that team part of it is what made it fun. I was loving it. So talk to us a little bit about those first three years. I know you work a lot you know, with students and with early chiropractors as well. What are your thoughts on those first three years and how important it is to get plugged into the right team environment? Yeah, Bobby, that was a great example of why team is so critical is like the energy, you kept it light, it was game, it was fun. And sometimes when we're isolated, like you said, we can make it so heady and such a heavy lift even though it is a lot of work, you can get really bogged down and then the energy drops. And so I like boiling everything down to energy on some level. And I think when you create a mastermind effect, even if it's you and one CA, there's magic there in that you both are eye on the vision. You know what you're after. You're starting to like pick each other up. You know, we all have bad days sometimes or moments where we walk into the practice and we're not at our highest level. But when you got to show up with someone else, uh, you know, you're going to show up possibly in a little different energetic framework. So I think that's a huge part of it is recognizing you're accountable to someone else. And and if you were like me and you were totally green when you started and you had never considered yourself as someone's quote unquote boss before, or, you know, that you are the leader of an actual business now and people are looking to you for like, what do we do next? What do we show up like? What's the plan here? Um, which is also why, you know, some of what we've already started to cover in this podcast about systems is so critical too, because you, you've got to come with a plan. And I remember thinking early on, okay, I've got a CA or maybe I had a CA and a part-timer at that point, but still so much of it lived in my head because I didn't know how to like articulate and train and systematize so that I really could leverage other people. And and that's kind of the next level of this is first, it's attracting the right people that have like the energy and the, the charisma to like do this thing, which is serving people. You have to kind of like people to serve them. Um, and so if we're new to that, we don't even sometimes know what we're looking for, right? So this is where getting proper coaching so you don't have expensive mistakes with some of your first hires is really, really a smart idea. Um, and then how do you grow with them, right? Because people want to buy into a bigger vision than themselves. You can get people to work really hard and sometimes not make as much money as an, in a different job, as long as they see the, like the culture is right, they can be part of something where we're actually helping people. And, and this is why chiropractic to me is like, wow, like, could there be a better profession? Like you can create a great life. You can take care of your health in the process and you get to help people do that. Like it's a win-win across the board. So um, a lot of that starts with us recognizing in those first years that, you know, you can like, kind of puff up your chest a little bit, you can create a great job opportunity for someone else to come in and grow a great career with you as the practice is growing. And um, I think sometimes we kind of like are meek about that, but there's a great opportunity for other people to see themselves within chiropractic that don't have a DC after their name. Um, mm -hmm. So Bobby, what are your thoughts in those first few years? Yeah, look, I, I look at the first few years as people go one or two directions, either traditional level associate, so they'll become an associate in somebody's office, or like myself, after eight months, I was like, oh, well, I'm launching, I found an office. So you will launch and you'll start building your own office. Um, so regardless of which path you go down, the number one thing is whether you're going into an associateship is looking at the people that are on that team. So looking at, first of all, the principal, the leader, the CEO, okay, the person who usually owns the business, who's the visionary, how aligned are you with their vision story? Are they able to articulate a vision story for you that excites you? Because that creates good energy, guys. You know, I gave an example there over the screening, but I can insert multiple examples there. I can say, better results, faster workshop. If you get thrust into, all right, hey, there's a workshop every two weeks that you're going to do for our new practice members. Here's a slideshow. You know, rehearse this a couple of times, and then you're, just, you're on your own, okay? That's completely different compared to there's a team of four of us here. We all execute better results faster on an alternating, on an alternating roster. Why don't you first come to our BRF workshop? Here's the slides. Why don't you watch me do some, right? Okay, why don't you watch Dr. Ned do some? Why don't you watch Dr. Nathan do some, right? So you start to get runs on the board and then totally, hey, you can start off by introducing Dr. Ned and then exiting Dr. Ned and you can start moving into running your own VR workshops, okay? It's so much more fun when you're doing it as a team or whether it's, you know what, we're doing a dinner workshop. There's 45 people we're putting into a room and there's five teams that are going to be there. So your role is going to be one of the people at the end 
It goes around and gets all the sign-ups, signs up new people, books appointments, takes payment. If you look around, there's like three or four other people on your team that are doing the same thing. That fuels your energy. It almost becomes like, hey, Lona, how many are you up to? I've got four people in so far. I've got five, right? Bob, how many are you up to? I've got six, right? It's like, boom, and there's still more people to talk to. It's like, if you're an associate, you want to look at that team that you're going into and that energy because energy in your office is everything. Mm. Now, if on the other hand, Lona, you're someone that's launching, you also need to get clear with like, okay, what's your team people building plan look like? Because we have offices that we launch that go from zero to a million in the first year in collections. And then we have offices that launch that go to zero to $500,000 in the first year of collections. But either way, you want to have a team building plan because you want to already know, okay, well, when I get to this point, he's the first personality style, the first I'm looking for, right? Is it a check-in CA? Is it a check-out CA? And it usually should be your complement. So you should understand, all right, what are your natural skill sets? Where are areas that you're strong in? So the first person you hire, you can hire your complement, right? Somebody who's going to be naturally skilled and strong in areas that you're not necessarily the best in, right? And then the second hire can be someone who's more of your clone, but you should have a people building plan. So at what point am I onboarding new team members? What kind of team members am I building and onboarding? So that part of it is really key and important. Um, one thing though I definitely want to do is I want to give everyone some tools here, Lana. So if I'm an associate or if I'm a doc that's launching and building and going to look at building my team or if I'm someone who's scaled. So I've already got a team, but guys, I'm looking to take my team to the next level. I'm looking to like really kind of pick everything up. Um, we talk about that there's two really essential tools that help you now identify do you have people that are on the same page as you. So let me give you an example. You're an associate, you've got two associate positions and you're trying to work out, all right, which team is going to give you a bit of support here. You're a launch build doc that's like about to start hiring their first person. You're trying to work out, is this person a good fit? You're a scale DC. You have multiple team members already and you're trying to work out who's awesome, A player, who's not. Okay, and then how do I get this right and how do I get this better with each team member hire? We talk about two tools that are really essential to have at the forefront of your mind and the deeper understanding you have with these two tools, the easier that decision is going to be. And I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about this. And those two tools that you really need to have guys on you is your core values. Okay. So what are your personal core values? Those things in your life that are most important to you. And then number two is your vision story for success in chiropractic. What does your vision look like? What are you trying to achieve? What do you see as success in chiropractic? So Dr. Weiner, I know that we on coaching calls go into detail with carving out your core values and your vision story because once you have these things, it's going to be so much easier for you to make the right decisions with the right people. I'd love for you to unpack that for us uh, in a little bit of a detail. How do you how do you first of all get these tools? What's your experience been with these tools? How do we really leverage our personal core values and our personal vision story for success to make sure that we surround ourselves with the right people on the same mission? Mm, it's so funny that you have brought the conversation here because earlier today I had this conversation with a doc who's launching and you could see a light bulb kind of go off because I think sometimes we can take our vision and maybe the values that we've written down and we think it's just an exercise for us. And I think a lot of chiropractors make that mistake where maybe they've been exposed to this conversation around vision and mission and values, but it's never actually been fully integrated into how they carry it out into their four walls of their practice and certainly how it's showcased to their team. And so, yes, you as CEO or you as the owner operator, you're going to be the like vision caster, but that doesn't mean also that they're not the people you attract in that, especially the longer they're with the team, the more they're like totally bought in, they're going to be part of collaborating on that vision and, and seeing it. But but they're never going to like replace the need for you to really be the chief like funnel for that vision to come through. And so what I was sharing with this doc earlier was just how important at each step of the way the vision and the values are both front facing when you're onboarding someone and really sharing like this is what we're about. This is where we're going. This is like the picture I'm painting you to buy in and see if this is like something you can equally get juiced up and excited about. Because if if someone is like, heck, yeah, I'm all about it, like okay, you know, like now I got to figure out like which role is right for you. Are you the right person it, characteristically and based off of like what you have for a skill set to do this? But if the person wasn't excited about the vision right from the get go, like that's a no, right? So your vision really should be something that either pulls people in 
or also helps you not make the mistake of hiring someone that actually is not going to pull energy in for that vision. And then the values are the same thing, right? It's like, how do you walk it out? So one of our, our values is connection. Another is efficiency. Um, and so what's interesting is like we, we, well, those two could do battle with each other potentially, right? Like we could have long drawn out connection or efficient connection, right? And so we'll have these conversations about how we do and carry out our procedures and, and our roles on the team within those procedures, keeping in mind that our values are connection, but they're also efficiency. Um, and so what's nice about that is it, it cultivates an environment when we've been that transparent to right from the get-go say, this is what we're about. This is where we're heading. These are things that are very, very much important. They're so important. They're on the wall in our team room. And, and we're not just talking about them. They're not just words that live on the wall, right? Like we're bringing them back around for every quarterly meeting. They're right there in front of our face for our regular meetings. What happens then is sometimes people need to be let off the bus. And if you started with the vision and you're coming back to it, sometimes it's as easy as saying, remember when we agreed that this is where we were going and this was the role that you were hired for and these were the things that were going to lead into this vision happening and I'm noticing these behaviors and we're not getting there, it's much easier to just say, you know, what's the plan to course correct here? Or are you just actually not the right fit for this role and this vision? And sometimes I've had people say, you're right, I'm not actually, I'm not here for this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, that was such an easier conversation than if we would not have had that buy-in um, yeah. or, or being able to let them off the bus. So for me, yeah. it's, it's critical. Mm -hmm. Spot on. I agree. And if you're listening to this and you're someone who's doesn't matter which season of practice you're in, one thing that I know that can you can do right now as an exercise to strengthen your result and strengthen the chance of you getting the outcomes and results that you want and desire, not just for the next quarter that you're listening to, but for the next 12 months and beyond you're listening to, one of the things that you can do is sit down and get present with yourself. Okay? Find some space and time. So if you listen to this in the car, you're going for a jog, you really need to like find space time with a pen and paper, right? Lock out some time and ask yourself this question. What does success look like for me? And just sit and ponder that question. What does success look like for me? And we say that you should have crystal clear clarity around 12 months from now. Another great way to structure this question to yourself, they can start to get the creative juices flowing, is I like to say to people this, if we were sitting here 12 months from now, right exactly this time, 12 months from now, having a, uh, having a, 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 having a drink, having a beer, having a glass of wine together, and you're absolutely stoked with how your business has unfolded over the last 12 months, with how things are looking, where you're like, oh, Dr. Bobby, this is amazing, I'm stoked, right? Business and career and progression has been off the charts last 12 months, right? What does that look like for you? What needs to happen? If you were sitting here 12 months from now saying that, now you might be a doc that's just launching now, that literally isn't like zero visits a week, and you're like, oh, Bob, if I was sitting here 12 months from now and we're on 200 visits a week and we are billing 12,000 bucks a week and I've got my first two team members, I'm getting close to the capacity I want to be on. We've already started the onboarding process of an associate. They're within their first 90 days. They're getting ready. They're aligned. We're energized. We're doing marketing events, speaking gigs, screening gigs already together. They are set for a launch. We've already pre-booked 50 new patients in the books for them. I'm so excited for the next two quarters for them because we're going to plan now. I got to 180, 200 in 12 months. Our plan is now let's get them to 180 in three months. And we're already back ending the book with new patients and we've got our team built out. There's trainings that happen. Like, as you can see, guys, I can go into detail with this. <laughs> so, so the deeper that you get with your clarity, all right, the higher the likelihood of achieving it. Lana, what's been your experience with this? Clarity and vision story. Okay, I just want to iterate. Like, you make that seem so easy with what you did right there. And I know there are people listening right now that need to just go and rewind and watch how that just rolled off his tongue. All these things that he would have in a row to, like, take this practice there. And, and you can see like Bobby is masterful at being able to envision. And then it is not a coincidence that he runs the enterprise in chiropractic that he does. And that has, we don't get to see all the hard work that mentally has gone on for Bobby to get to the point where he can just roll that off with ease like that. So that is part of the homework right there of just, you know, yours may not be 
as as wild and big as what Bobby just said there, what's your version of that? And and how specific can we get in the detail that you spend thinking about what that looks like? And that's that to me is the hard work for people is no one can give you your vision, right? Like, yes, you can catch other people's vision, but when we in chiropractic say above, down, inside out, right? Like nobody else has your own channel running through you. So what is that version for you that you are going to have to spend some mental energy on to think it out and to find the people who are going to help you get clear about it? That's where we don't live in a vacuum is there's other people who can help shed light onto your vision and share with you some things that you maybe should consider that could be part of your vision, but you've got to do that work. You've got to catch your own vision. Yeah, 100%. And I just want to make it very clear, guys, from everyone listening, that my first time doing it did not sound like that, <laughs> right? But that's why I said you've got to create space and time where you sit down and you clarify this. And this is an unearthing process that happens over time, right? Now, one other thing I want to make sure that we touch base on because we said there's two tools that you need to be armed with. One is your vision store for success and your second is your core values. So your personal core values. Now... One thing that's been my experience with this is the more advanced that a DC or a business person gets, okay? So the more developed, the more advanced they get, the more and more and more they recognize how important clarity around core values is. Whereas in the beginning, we're like, hey, core values, I know that's kind of important, but it's not as fun as, hey, tell me how do I sign up 20 new weeks from the screen, right? Okay, but I can tell you there's something to be said when the more advanced doc you speak to, the more they recognize how important core values is. So, Lana, I'd love for you to just take us through what would be some exercise of how, if I'm listening to this, how am I someone, what can I do to really unearth and clarify my core values for me more? How can I work out what's important to me? What are the things in my life that are most important to me? What are my core values? What are these things that I know are important to me? Because if I know what this is, then I can look for other people that share similar core values. Mm-hmm. I think there's a couple ways that I've been taught to look at core values, and I think they're all slightly different and they bring out different things. So on a personal level, there's looking at, you know, the resources we have, time, energy and money and starting to really look at where do I spend those every single month, every single week and get really honest with yourself. Like, where does my money go? Where does my time go? Where does my energy go? And then kind of put those in order, right? And it's not a judgment thing. It's more just like brutal facts. Like, where am I spending my currencies? And is that in alignment with the vision that I have for my life moving forward? Or where are some of those currencies going to need to change? And then there's there's the values part of looking at um, basically words, a list of words, and starting to figure out, you know, is, you know, I listed a couple of mine being efficiency and connection as far as the practice is concerned. Um, Those would be high in my personal list as well, but maybe efficiency not as high. Um, And freedom, for many of us, freedom is a very top value. You know, it might also be joy or love or um, I, I like aliveness too. I want to feel like I'm excited about life. You know, so when you start to look at these adjectives, basically of, of like how you could describe your life and what you want your life to be about and what you want your business to be about, then you kind of rank them. Like which one is really close to the top? Or if you have to bottle it down to like, what's the top 10 and then what's the top five. And I've been through exercises that were pretty cutthroat trying to make you like have to go through a situation where you narrow it down to one, which gets really difficult sometimes. Like, do I choose love or freedom? Do I choose, you know, but these are exercises that help you clarify and know yourself better, which also helps you understand how you make decisions, right? This isn't about shaming you. We all say that like family should be top of it. list. Well, it's not for everyone. Right. Um, and, and part of it is just knowing, how you operate. And also sometimes when you're out of balance with your values, if we can connect things together, like, oh, if, you know, if family's top of the list and I'm fine, I'm feeling like building a practice, I'm taking away time from my family. Okay. But how about if I pour into my practice and can create more freedom because my practice is doing better now, my, t- my family's going to benefit in how many ways. Right. And so that's where just any exercise that gets you looking and introspective at these type of things, I think is amazing. Um, yeah. Bobby, how about you? What are some of your experiences just working through the, the exercise in your mind over values? It's yeah, super powerful. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I just want to highlight one thing that so many times we have these self-limiting beliefs and 
a major self-limiting belief that I've come across people is, well, you can't have it all. Have you ever heard that one before, right? Well, you can't have an amazing cranking practice, a super fit, healthy, rocking body, right? Full of sleep and full of freaking energy every single day and an amazing family life, right? And have vacations and see a bucket load of people. You can't have it all, right? Well, let me tell you this. I'm here right now, if there's one thing you hear from this, to tell you that that is bullshit, right? You can absolutely have it all. Okay, in chiropractic, guys, in the career path that we're in, in the purpose that we're in, you can have it all. You can have a thriving practice, an amazing healthy body, an amazing empowered and rich relationship with your spouse, great family life, right? Amazing business, fantastic friend. You can have it all. However, you can't have everything, which means, okay, I want everything. No, so that's why it's so important to identify your core values and what's important to you. So the way that I find, and Lona, you, you smashed it when you said, you know, you can look at words. Yes, definitely looking words I find is super helpful, okay? However, I then look at my action steps as well, and I ask myself this question. Where are there things that when these issues occur in my life, oh, I feel a bit uneasy, I get that gut response inside of my tummy? Because that usually tells me the contradiction in the core value, right? Let me give you an example. If I, like, skip a few workout days, right, because, like, I should have worked out, damn, I wasn't this one, I didn't work out. If I don't work out for a week, right? I feel crap about that. I don't like that. Oh, big deal. No, we've gone. So that tells me I have a core value around fitness, health on some level, right? Now, here's the thing. If I also am robbing my sleep all the time, robbing my sleep, right? And I'm, I'm working out, but I'm robbing my sleep. And I see, you know, my heart rate variability is dropping. I also feel uneasy about that too. So the core value isn't necessarily fitness. The core value is health. And I understand that health has multiple parts to it, right? There's physical, chemical, emotional. Sleep is an important part of health. Training, exercise is an important part of health. Um, so that shows me I've got a contradiction core value. Let me tell you another thing. Um, if I am, um, if I'm not communicating truthfully with somebody, okay, if I, I always make it a mission to make sure I'm truthfully communicating. But if something's happened, let me give you an example of this, right? When I was a chiropractic student, terrible, terrible, I got to fess up here, right? When I was a chiropractic student, I was like maybe second year. I had to go, I had a holiday booked overseas for six weeks flying. It was like a European adventure. And I got a CA job in January. And they asked me, they're like, oh, do you have any holidays planned? And I was like, oh, no. But I kind of knew I was going for six weeks in Europe in July, right? And so I was like, oh, crap. You know, I feel a bit uneasy about that. Long story cut short, I go on this trip, right? I was like, oh, I've got to go overseas. I've got a court case overseas. I don't know where it came from. I was like 21 years old. Some of it was truth. Like I did have, there was like some family dispute over a property over there that we had to go settle, right? Um, but the reality is the whole time I was like, oh my God, I feel horrible about this, right? And what I recognized is I kind of shot myself in the foot. I should just in the interview said, yes, guys, I do. I've got a holiday plan in Europe. It's for six weeks at this this time. But in that moment, I was like, no, I don't think I do. And I was like, oh, Chris, I do, right? I kind of shot myself in the foot. But I hated that experience, which tells me I've got a core value around truthful communication. All right. Whereas I can tell you people that I've met in my life that will lie through their teeth, left, right, and center, doesn't bother them at all. I can tell you people that are 300 pounds or 100 kilos overweight, doesn't bother them more. Right. So what it tells you is that they don't have a core value around truthful communication or around health and fitness. So I find a good litmus test learner is if there's anything in your life where you're like, oh, I feel uneasy about that. Right. Okay. It's a contradiction core value. You should, you should look deeper at that. So good. And, and I think Bobby kind of bringing it back full circle, like when we do this deep work, we eventually, whether it's taking our, our staff to seminars with us to grow them too, like they get to do this work too. And this is part of like creating that culture and that energetic connection to all things. People grow with us. We're going to, we're not growing as leaders by ourselves, we're growing our team. And, and a lot of these things that we do for ourselves to know ourselves better and to carry our visions out, we want the same for those on our teams. And that's how we really create a mastermind effect as well as people who are like, you know, showing up in ways that you could never quote unquote pay for, if you will, um, in the sense that they're just so bought in. Yeah, hundred percent. So big takeaway for today is this, guys. Doesn't matter what season you're in, if you're listening to this today, I encourage you, carve out some time in your routine. The sooner the better. And in that time, you want to get conscious, you want to get deep with yourself, you want to ask some of the questions that Dr. Lowe and I covered today. And through that process, you want to unearth two things. Your core values. What are your personal core values? What's important to you? We share things about family. We share things about health. We share things about truthful communication. 
We share things about, you know, I have a core value around teamwork and accountability. I have a core value around takes initiative. I love seeing someone who takes initiative. So once you're clear where you have some level of clarity, you don't have to have yet crystal clear clarity, but some level of clarity, higher than what it is currently. And then same thing with your vision story. What does success look like for me? 12 months from now, if I was sitting here and I was absolutely stoked over the moon with what practice looks like and what my life looks like, tell me what that looks like. Right? And don't worry about the how. Don't worry about, oh, I'm sure you fucking do it. No, 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 no. Don't worry about that. Right? If it's been done once before, it can be done again. There is a way to do it. Just worry about what the success look like for you. Because when you're armed with those two bits of information, then whether you're going and looking for associateships, you're looking for someone that has alignment in that. Whether you're hiring your first team members and you're hiring your CA staff, you can pull that out literally and get, we have a core cool value around takes initiative. We love people that go above and beyond and don't necessarily have to like ask questions around everything. We have a core value around truthful communication. We have a core value around teamwork and accountability. So here you'll be held accountable to roles and responsibilities. We expect us to be held accountable as well. That's what leads to better outcomes for our practice members. So you're looking for team members that are like, yes, I love that. I love that. I love that, right? When you have those two things, you have the tools that you need to really start either becoming involved in a team that's aligned with you that you can then grow with or attracting team members to you that likewise are going to help you scale. Dr. Lana, final thoughts? I love that you said, don't worry about the how. I just want to like double click on that for everyone. The vision and the values don't need to be in the minutia, right? And so keep it light, keep it playful as you're playing in that space, because you will pull probably massive growth to you. The more you align, like Bobby said, the biggest practices that he works with know how important that conversation really is. Exactly. You just get clear with the what and the why. The how, that's just systems process. We'll help you with that. In fact, if you're someone listening to that and you want to go deeper with the how, what, what's the how? How do I launch an office to seven figures in my first year? How do I scale my office to multiple associates, multiple locations? Guys, if you want any information, advice on that, please reach out to us. We'll leave a link in the show notes. Jump on the call every week on the back of this podcast. Dr. Lane and myself leave time aside to chat with people who have questions around that create clarity for you because clarity is your number one accelerant. So we'd love to have a chat to you about our agenda on those call guys is to sell you nothing. Our agenda number one is to give you massive value, help you grow because by you growing, chiropractic grows. But of course, at the same time, if it's a fit, if it's something that we can definitely make sure we get your outcomes with, we can give you solutions for that as well. Dr. Lina, it's been a pleasure as always. And guys, if you love this, please, one way you can help us out, we do these every single week. We're going to record them, right? And we just want to give value to you guys. One of the ways you can help us is Give us a nice five-star podcast review. It really helps with the rating of this show. You'll see it in the show notes very easy. There's three little dots that you click on. It says rate show, five stars, and give us a few nice positive words. Yes. Thanks, Bobby. Love it. Until next time, we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Build Your Remarkable Practice podcast. Remember, what the world needs now is chiropractic, and what chiropractic needs now is more successful chiropractors. If you like the podcast, please subscribe, share with your friends, and leave us a review. And if you'd like to connect with us personally, please click the links in the show notes to schedule a call.